back to the program. As promised, we're joined now by Key Crossbencher, Liberal Democrat Senator David Linehelm. Thanks for your company. Thank you. Well, you caused a stir last week. We'll get to that in a minute. But I, can, I, can I start by asking you about, uh, about Bob Day? I know that you two have been very close in a lot of your voting patterns and also close personally. Mm. Um, there's calls from various quarters that he has to hurry up and resign because of this argument that his business is in liquidation and therefore he may well be insolvent and all the rest of it. What do you say to that? He only has to resign if he's bankrupt. He's only compelled mm. to resign. Everything else is just, um, you know, smoke and mirrors or, or he thinks he's doing the honourable thing, resigning if he owes a lot of people money. And uh, so he's not under any obligation short of bankruptcy to resign. He has said he will resign, but um, so there are two things that are holding him back, as I understand it. One is um, his party has chosen a candidate. Well, I don't know whether they've chosen. I'm no, not they're sure still looking at choosing, I think. Yeah. I think he's concerned that they're going to choose a candidate who sees the world very differently. That's from the state Bob. MP. Yes. Mm. Apparently that guy sees the world in, very different, uh, in a different way from Bob. I've always... In what way? Because they're obviously in the same party. Um, well, the descri I don't know. I've, I've met uh, Robert Brokenshire, but um, I don't know his attitudes. But I'm told he's a bit like Nick Xenophon, very parochial about South Australia, right. protectionist, preferred purchase type person, all that sort of stuff. You know, um, you know, basically a soft socialist. Um, so he wouldn't necessarily be amenable to things like ABCC, certainly not wider free market issues? Correct. That, okay. That's what I understand. I hope I'm not verbaling him there when I say that, but that's my understanding, yes. Okay. So that, that's, that's one issue. Bob doesn't want to be replaced by somebody with very substantially different views. But what happens, but in a sense, if he loses control of that, is there a possibility that he stays rather than goes for the wrong candidate? Well, that's the other interesting side to it, is that... Um, he, last time I spoke to him, he was relatively optimistic that his business could be go into receivership rather than liquidation and that a buyer would be found. And now if a buyer is found and takes it, takes it off his hands or takes most of it off his hands, uh, then obviously he won't go personally bankrupt, so he'll be under no obligation to leave. And then he, he might stay? He may. Well, I, I hope he will. I hope he will. He and I work very closely together. We have a great deal in common on economic things, not social things. But has he expressed that view to you at all, that he would be hopeful of perhaps being able to stay? Because he hasn't formally resigned, as you say, he's just announced the intention mm. to resign. Um, I think it's still up in the air. I don't think he's made any firm decisions about it. And, and until the business side of things is sorted, I doubt if he'll, he'll address it more seriously other than to say, well, he doesn't need to go immediately. He, he's not going to. He has said he wants to st stick around and vote for the ABCC bill, okay. and that's going to be put to the Senate before the end of the year. I would think. So that he's expressed that to you. Yes. Okay. Um, so I, my thinking is that uh, he probably won't resign until uh, if, late this year or perhaps early next year if he goes. But and by then, who knows? If the yeah. company, if the business has been sold, then he may choose to stay on instead. Mm. Yeah. That, well, that's a possibility. I don't really know his thinking. I, I think he would like to to stay. Um, but what he does definitely not want to do is have two jobs. He doesn't want to be trying to run his business at the same time he's being a senator. It's very difficult. Uh, I do it, but my business is really tiny. Uh, and I do know that others who have done the same thing, had two, two things, two jobs, have found it extremely difficult. And uh, I know he's well and truly over it. And that's where, if you can find a buyer, it solves a couple of problems, potentially. One, obviously, if they take the whole thing off his hands, including any debt mm. that needs to be repaid, then, he, as you say, doesn't go personally bankrupt, mm. not at all. And equally, he then has the time to go back to what is his day job at the moment, which is continuing to serve as a senator. Correct. That's, that's correct. Yes, that's right. He, and, you know, having said, I'm going to resign, he, got, he was under no obligation to say he would resign. He was going to do it because he didn't think it would be right to stay on in Parliament owing people uh, a lot of money, with a lot of people losing money. He didn't think that was the honourable thing to do. If, if that doesn't happen, if, if lots of people aren't owed money, mm. presumably the honourable thing doesn't require him to, to uh, resign. So I'm hopeful that that might be the outcome. The, you, you mentioned that he's told you that, uh, that he intends to stay on and vote for the ABCC legislation. The opposition, as well as on this program earlier today, the Greens, they're trying to argue that it's a tainted vote. Uh, that you, know, you can't take the vote of somebody whose business is in liquidation. What's your reaction to that? Uh, I, I don't know where they get that idea from. There's nothing tainted about it. He was properly elected, the same as they were. I guess so the only... I, I tell you where it comes <coughs> from, I would argue. Uh, I don't disagree with what you're saying, by the way, but I guess where it comes from is in that hyper-partisan world of the major parties, that's exactly what the 
Liberals in opposition were saying about Craig Thompson's vote, of mm. course, mm. Uh, and now, of course, they're rejecting that applying to Bob Day in a different context. Yeah, well, Craig Thompson was being accused of misappropriating funds from, the, from his employer, a union. There's no suggestion of that in Bob's case. Bob is one of the most decent, honourable people you could get and uh, he would no more appropriate money than he would uh, execute his own mother. So if so, you're a betting man, uh, do you think he'll stay beyond the end of this year? I really don't know enough about his business to know how likely it is that he'll get out of it without feeling as if he owes people money and he, and he can't stay. Um, I, obviously, I'm hoping he, he does do that, but uh, no, I don't know enough about it. Um, he, he hasn't gone into details about his business. I've known it's troubled him the entire time he's been in the Senate, but uh, the details are not, uh, I'm not privy to. On the matter from last week, uh, where you sort of exploded onto the national spotlight, uh, we'll get to the issue of guns specifically in a moment, but the politics around it, let's start with that if we can. Uh, there seems to be a bit of a debate about whether or not Tony Abbott engaged through his office or you know, through his ministers in horse trading with you on issues versus whether it constituted horse trading, what you've been looking at with Malcolm Turnbull's government since then. Do you consider them apples and apples here? Horse trading is part and parcel of, of getting stuff through the Senate. That's normal. And all this huffing and puffing about you know, getting a deal on one issue in order to get a vote on another issue, that, that's just a load of claptrap. Brian Harradine, back in the, many years ago in the Senate, uh, developed that into a fine art. He was an absolute expert at it. I'm not doing anything different, and nor are the other crossbenchers, nor was the Abbott government when, uh, when it was the Abbott government, nor, nor would Labor be any different. In fact, there are occasionally deals that Labor does with the crossbench um, in order to get their vote on amendments or motions and things like that. So it, is a normal, it is a normal part and parcel of politics. Um, the, the difference between Abbott and Turnbull is, I think, um, well, how can I put this? Uh, perhaps one of decency. Um, when uh, they, when uh, Keenan and uh, Dutton did a deal with me, they had no intention of uh, sticking to that deal. No intention whatsoever. It was a, a bad faith deal right from the start. So they were going to get their half of it before you got yours and then they were going to back out. That's right. Um, Abbott has now said, well, I would have done the same thing, basically. Now, Turnbull has, uh, is, is at heart a decent guy, I think, on that sort of thing. He acknowledges that, uh, that you can't do, deal with the crossbench and me, including me, on that basis, that you have to have a, a, a foundation of trust and keep to your deals. If you do a deal, you've got to keep to it. And um, so when, when Turnbull was asked at the very first doorstop last week about this issue, and he, and he hummed and hard a little bit, what he was doing was in fact trying to maintain his relationship with me, which I thought was a, you know, quite a fair thing to do. I, I was listening to him and thinking, I know why you're doing this, you understand. and he knew that I was unhappy about mm. the fact the deal had been, I'd been dudded on the deal. So, you know, he was trying to maintain the, his relationship with me because we'd been talking about, well, what are we going to do about this? Um, I, I thought that, you know, that was the decent thing to do. He then, he then had no option because the Labor Party went after him and, and it was characterised as a lessening of the gun laws, which was a load of crap right and, from the start. And just on that, on the gun yeah. laws in particular, can we clarify this? So this Adler gun uh, that we're talking about, it's a seven-shot gun. There's already a five-shot gun allowed in, is that right? Yeah, the import ban is on the seven-shot seven shot gun. Okay. So a seven-shot magazine, exactly the same shotgun, it's just it has a longer tube magazine under the barrel. It takes okay. seven rounds, and the five, but the five-shot one is available. And yes. just to be clear, there are guns that are currently available that are as part of that A or B or C categorisation, which are more rapid fire than the Adler. That's correct, isn't it? Uh, well, um, it depends what it judges rapid. You could fire an old... Uh, Lee Enfield, World War One, three oh three, faster than you can fire an Adler, um, and that, you know, the, so that's um, 70, 80 years old. Mm. Um, so there, th that's a B category. Shotguns are still, uh, even despite last week, still all in category A. But the difference between category A and category B is you just need a reason. You need to provide a reason to get a category okay. B. There's not a huge difference, um, and. Um, uh, and I, I think that it's, a, it's an absolutely artificial debate over two rounds. It's just an, an additional uh, little bit of length on the tube magazine that goes under the barrel. That's all and it why is. do you need it? Why do you think some people need the extra two rounds? 
Um, well, I don't. I don't have a lever action shotgun. I have no intention of uh, buying, buying one. The, the question is, why shouldn't you have one in a free society that the onus is on the regulator to explain why they want to regulate something? There's no logical reason why seven shots is dangerous and five shots is not dangerous. If they're dangerous, they're both dangerous, and, or they're equally non-dangerous, whatever the, the case may be. Um, there is a case for saying if you're shooting a mob of pigs um, and they're often in litters, and so it would be quite common to, uh, to come across seven of them or, or five, for example, and you miss once, so you need an extra shot. Loading a lever action shotgun with a tube magazine is a slow exercise. It's not mm. something you can just do bang, 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 you know, and st stick more shots in. It's a fairly slow thing. So if, once you've fired the full magazine, that's it. You know, they've run away by that stage. So, um, so there is a case for it. But the main reason I'm opposing it, I'm not, we're not talking about lessening of gun laws or loosening of gun laws. What we're talking about is not making them any more onerous. They are extraordinarily onerous in Australia, extremely onerous. And there are countries that have the same levels of violence, gun violence, overall violence as Australia, very, very similar, which have much more relaxed gun laws. So uh, New Zealand, mm. Canada, Switzerland, Czech Republic, very relaxed gun laws in those countries, and yet their level of violence is comparable to ours. It's not about gun laws and violence. It's just people don't like guns. That's what it amounts to. And there's a perception issue now with the way it's been framed, but we're going to have to leave it there. No doubt we'll be talking more about this before the year's out. Senator David Lyon, I always appreciate you finding the time to talk to us. Thanks once again. Pleasure. We're going to take a quick break here on the